Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this virtual town hall meeting. My name is Jennifer Gale, and I'm the president of the River Heights Chamber of Commerce, which represents South St. Paul and Invergrove Heights. We're very excited for tonight's event. Before I hand it over to Representative Craig, I'd like to go over the agenda for this evening. Shortly, Congresswoman Craig will provide an update on her work in Congress. Then, Dr. Michael Osterholm, the director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota, will give an update on the coronavirus pandemic. Following the remarks, I'll be asking the questions that you all comment below. This town hall has Minnesota rules, which means we will all treat one another with respect. Tough questions are great and welcome. Obscenity is not allowed and those questions will not be asked. We will save the last 15 minutes for non-coronavirus related questions if there are any. So with that, I will hand it over to Representative Craig to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and to give our opening remarks. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. It's an honor and a pleasure to be back here with you this evening, and it's going to be uh, just terrific when we can come back together in person again. I start off every town hall uh, by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, so tonight will be no different. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And with that, Jennifer, thank you so much for moderating uh, our town hall this evening. This is our 16th town hall since I was sworn into the United States Congress. I want to start out tonight by some uh, opening remarks, uh, and then uh, I am so incredibly pleased to have uh, Mike uh, Osterholm here with us, uh, Osterholm here with us this morning. Um, this is a different town hall. Uh, this is in the midst of a public health crisis. And no matter what our questions are here tonight, I wanna make sure that we never forget uh, that each of the 94 deaths that we have seen across the state of Minnesota, the now 34,000 deaths that we've seen across the United States and even more across the world, that we never forget that these are people that uh, they are husbands and wives and parents and grandparents. Uh, they are our neighbors, and we have to make sure that these numbers that we see every day, that we don't become numb to them. With that, um, I just want to also acknowledge that within the midst of the public health crisis, we also have significant stress and anxiety um, that is coming from the economic impact of uh, COVID-19 pandemic and financial challenges within uh, our neighbors' uh, homes across the congressional district, the state, and across the country. In Minnesota, we now have 482,000 of our neighbors uh, who have sought unemployment insurance benefits since um, the 16th of March. There are now 22 million Americans who are unemployed. And with that, uh, we need to keep in mind that the pandemic has caused a lot of stress and anxiety across the country. In Congress, we have now passed three bills, which I'm going to call them uh, simply rescue bills. We are in triage mode right now. Um, we passed the CARES Act, uh, the last of the three, which was a $2.2 trillion bill uh, that provided uh, a number of uh, appropriations dollars for personal protective equipment, for unemployment insurance, uh, for programs like the Payment uh, Paycheck Protection Act, which I know we're going to talk a lot more about here uh, this evening. Uh, we have to make sure that as a Congress that we uh, are accountable to taxpayers for how we use these dollars. And so that's something that we have to make sure that we prioritize moving forward. Um, this district, this country, healthcare and the economy remain uh, the top two issues. And certainly the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic only heightens the two most important issues in the second congressional district. So this is our 16th town hall. It's a little different again uh, here uh, this month. Um, throughout the course of my service, though, to the second congressional district, um, I have now introduced 21 pieces of legislation. Two have passed the House. One has been signed into law by the president. 
Uh, I've co-sponsored over 375 bills, two-thirds of which are bipartisan, and I sure hope throughout the course of uh, lawmakers uh, dealing with COVID-19, we can continue to be and work on a bipartisan basis. I've met with over 10,000 Minnesotans. Right now, we are working with over 200 businesses to make sure that they get access to uh, the PPP loans or other information they need to survive. Uh, we've brought over 40 Minnesotans home uh, from abroad uh, during this pandemic. And I just wanna um, make a shout out to my uh, casework team who works every single day to make sure we're serving the people uh, of this district. Since our last town hall, uh, we have been working hard to make sure that uh, folks in the second district have the information that they need uh, to survive as uh, well as possible, both from a health perspective as well as an economic perspective through um, this pandemic. Uh, in particular, I have focused on making sure that uh, our local lenders, our community banks and our community credit unions were able to lend money out of the Paycheck Protection Program. And that is now underway and we need to fill, uh, backfill those coffers uh, as well. I have made sure through the CARES Act that we had appropriations in the bill so that our uh, IEP students or IE, IDEA students, special education had the resources that they need to be able to fulfill those IEPs. I've advocated for a strong relief to our uh, cities and our towns throughout the second congressional district. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure, here a little more this evening. Um, I've worked to try to fix an issue um, that emerged out of the CARES Act, the Senate version, which defined a dependent as 16 and younger and left out our 17 and 18 year olds, our students up to age 24, and our disabled adult dependent children. Um, I've also introduced a bill that would provide a block grant program to our smaller cities and towns because we know the impact of COVID-19 uh, on our economies and our city goes beyond just those larger communities. Um, I've also worked directly with many of the small business owners in this congressional district who have heartbreaking stories about, you know, trying to keep their employees on the payrolls and those families supported during these very, very difficult times. Um, we need an interim emergency supplemental package. Uh, I wrote to leadership today saying we need to get this done now. Uh, you need to bring us back if you need to, but we have got to make sure that we support our small businesses on an ongoing basis. I've written to leadership saying we have got to appropriate money for relief for our cities and towns. And we also have to not forget that our hospitals are uh, in dire need of support as they treat COVID-19 patients. At the end of the day, we need a national strategy around testing capacity. We need a national supply chain strategy. We need to make sure that we have a national strategy for personal protective equipment. We as a Congress must continue to push for these things because those are the things that will enable us to slowly and based on scientific and medical opinion, reopen our economy. We've got to remain flexible. Uh, we won't control what is needed in these future packages. The virus is going to control that, unfortunately, but we have to remain flexible as a Congress and make sure that we continue to work on a bipartisan basis to get this done. So again, thank you so much uh, for joining us here online this evening for, again, another uh, virtual town hall. Uh, now it is my absolute pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Uh, Michael Osterholm, who is with us uh, this evening. Dr. O Osterholm is an internationally recognized expert in infectious disease epidemiology. He spent his career tracking infectious diseases in an effort to understand their origin and ultimately prevent them. I shared with him offline this evening that I just ordered um, his book, The Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs. I look forward to reading that. And he's also an adjunct professor in the medical school uh, at the University of Minnesota and the director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy there. Dr. Osterholm, thank you so much for joining us this evening and for your incredible work uh, 
over the last several weeks and uh, your entire career. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative, for having me. It's my honor to be here with uh, you tonight uh, and to share a perspective on where we're at and where we're going uh, with this very historic time. I think all of us uh, in the public health world will tell you that uh, this has not uh, really been a, uh, one of those times that we relish, cherish, or hope for, but we all worried that it was coming, and one day it finally did come. Uh, this particular virus, uh, the uh, COVID-19 disease, the SARS-CoV-2 virus emerged, as we know, from a uh, source in Wuhan, China, I'll just say for the audience's sake that despite all kinds of rumors and uh, suggestions that there may have been uh, an intentional human release or that there was an accidental release from a laboratory there, we have very clear and compelling evidence from the genetics of the virus that it literally jumped from an animal species to a human, which is what the other coronaviruses, the type of virus that this is, have done in the past. Early on in, uh, with this uh, uh, outbreak and starting in Wuhan, China, in central uh, China. Uh, we've been following it very closely at our center at the University of Minnesota. We track diseases around the world. We reported on it in late December. And at the time, uh, there was actually some sense that, well, this will be over with fairly soon because we know from other serious coronavirus infections, SARS or MERS, the two different diseases, one having originated in China in 2003, MERS originated in the Arabian Peninsula in 2012, that in fact, uh, these people did not really become very infectious until the fifth or sixth day of their illness. And if we could just identify people early, get them into the hospitals, get them in isolation so they didn't transmit the virus to anyone, then in fact, we were home free. Uh, unfortunately, it became clear in about the second week of January that this was going to be a very different situation that it was going to be one where there was much more influenza virus-like transmission, meaning early illness or early infection in the illness and maybe even before one got ill, which of course we learned later was exactly the case. Also very dynamic transmission that basically someone sitting in a room literally could breathe enough of this virus just by talking or breathing into the room to infect others. So that that uh, added to the, the concern. Um, on January 20th, our center put out a document uh, to a number of groups that we can consult for and consult with and said this would be a global pandemic, a worldwide epidemic, meaning, and it was just a matter of time. The first week of February, we actually laid out a scenario suggesting that it would take about a month before a sufficient number of cases were disseminated around the world and if it had enough time to basically build up the infection in that given area. We uh, recognized even then that uh, it was apparent that uh, the what we call basically the incubation period, the period from uh, when someone's exposed and gets infected to when they actually become infectious or ill, it was about five days, and that on average, someone would transmit to at least two people. So we'd go from one to two, five days later, two to four, five days later, four to eight. In those early generations, there's not a lot of additional cases. By the time you start getting in the sixth to seventh generation, you can see the case numbers climb quickly. And that's what exactly what happened. We predicted it would show up in larger metropolitan areas around the world. Um, and uh, that uh, you would see the kind of things that we've seen. Uh, first in Iran, uh, we saw in, in Italy, we saw in New York, we saw in Seattle and places like that. Um, so where do we go next? What's happened? Well, we believe that this virus actually is mirroring in many ways the kind of uh, activities that the 1918 flu virus did realizing it's a coronavirus, but it's very similar in what it's doing as an influenza virus. And in 1918, uh, we had what was basically a spring wave of where cases uh, first started showing up primarily in the United States, and that they uh, were hit and miss in terms of where they caused uh, illness and disease. Chicago got hit hard, New York got hit hard, whereas Minneapolis, Detroit, Philadelphia, Boston did not. And then it kind of quieted down on its own. There was no human intervention that really had anything to do with that. And then only to come back uh, in late summer. And uh, the peaks uh, that occurred in North America were between September and November of that year, 1918. But uh, the waves of cases continued well into 1920. And so it also points out that, uh, as I'll share with you tonight, we're in for the long haul. Uh, I raise this because uh, 
I think that it's important to understand that we really are in the very, very earliest days of this pandemic. As Sir Winston Churchill once said, this is not the end. This is not the beginning of the end, but rather this is the end of the beginning. And uh, so if I had to tell you what I, I believe will be the case, this is really a second inning of the nine inning game. And that that's what we have to prepare for. That's why uh, we also recognize that as a world, we can't move in a shutdown world. We can't just suddenly decide that we will all just be in our homes for the rest of our uh, days. And one of the things that everyone is struggling with right now is how do we actually control this disease and how do we actually uh, live with this disease at the same time? It's a very sobering thought to think about the fact that um, this past week, uh, COVID-19 was the number one cause of death in this country. Just 40 days ago, it wasn't even in the top 75. So you get a sense of this is a disease of real impact. It's causing a great deal of disruption, not only in terms of human health, but also in terms of the economy, the business world. We understand that. I think Representative Craig did a very nice job tonight of illustrating the sensitivity to what this is doing. This is horrible. Um, and so what we're trying to figure out is how to navigate that. Our group has been very active in trying to push forward a national plan uh, that actually accounts for this. We will next week be coming up with much more specific information. But we all recognize that you just can't wall ourselves off for what might be 18 or 20 months and hope that a vaccine will show up that will save us. At the same time, we just can't let the cases run willy-nilly uh, and uh, spread to our communities in such a way that uh, you really will bring down healthcare systems. Uh, you will cause many, many people to die. Uh, you'll also, uh, at the same time, healthcare workers will be exposed, infected, and they will die as well as the fact those who have heart attacks and have cancer, who have asthma attacks or are injured, will also need health care. And when your health care systems are completely shut down uh, because of the overwhelming need for what goes on with the COVID-19, this is a critical issue. For anyone who knows someone or has uh, visited with someone who lives in New York, the thing that they can't get over and they will never forget is literally three weeks of constant sirens, 24 hours a day. That's what New York was like uh, during the height of this issue. So where do we go from here? As much as we've predicted this uh, pandemic to date, I think we all are, uh, first of all, uh, concerned that uh, this will continue as a virus to spread uh, for as long as it is until we have either 55 to 70 percent of the population infected and recovered. Uh, meaning that they hopefully will be protected from reinfection or the fact we have a vaccine. And uh, we believe at this point we have a long ways to go. If I could just give you one sobering thought as we ponder and where we go with this for our future, you know, there have been a lot made about models, about uh, these statistical uh, manipulations to determine what cases might be coming when and where. And there's been a lot of misunderstandings about models because they're all relative to the conditions upon which the maker of the model uh, put them into the model. Uh, so, for example, a recent uh, model put out by the University of Washington has predicted a much lower overall number of cases and case fatality rate of the percent of people who die than other uh, models did. But what no one really understood was that that particular model was based only on cases for these first four months and with the idea that we're in a Wuhan like the lockdown, which of course we haven't been and won't be. Um, at the same time, models like the one from Harvard and from the uh, Imperial College in London looked at an entire 18 month period and for which there was only uh, some benefit from a lockdown that had a mix of how well it was carried out. Now, you, I, I realize that you know, you all can sit there and say, boy, these black box models, they either favor this one or they favor that one, or whatever. I tend to agree, even though I've got a lot of graduate hours of statistics, I sit there and say, for all not, for all not. Let's just talk common sense. There are 320 million Americans in this country. If you figure 50% will get infected over time, which is a conservative number, that 50% equates to 160 million people. Based on what we know right now from the work we've done in Asia, in Europe, and in the United States, about 80% of the people who get infected will have an asymptomatic infection or very mild, mild illness. Of the remaining 20%, about 10% will seek medical care, uh, however, not needing to be hospitalized. 
an additional 10% will need to be hospitalized. And of those, about 5% will need intensive care medicine. Of those, on a very conservative basis, one half of 1% will die and or about 1%. Well, let's backtrack to that 160 million people. 1% of 160 million is 1.6 million people. A half a percent is 800,000 people. As of today, we've had just slightly over 23,000 deaths in this country, which is still atrocious, it's horrible. And as Representative Craig said, these represent people, they're our loved ones, they're family members, et cetera. They're never just numbers. But it should give you some sense of what many of us are concerned about is still coming down the pike the kinds of realities that we have to deal with for the months ahead. When I say we are just at the beginning, we really are. And so one of the things we have to figure out is in conjunction with uh, our leaders, uh, the business community, uh, our, our religious, uh, the citizens in general, is how do we get through this? What do we do to make sure that we don't end up bankrupting all these small businesses, that we don't hurt any further the people have been economically uh, compromised in a very severe way. But we also don't let this disease run rampant like we saw in New York or even in some cases in Detroit and, and, and Louisiana, New Orleans, and some of the rural areas there. So this is the struggle we're having right now. Our commitment at the our center is, number one, tell the truth. Just tell the straight truth. And I've often been told, well, you know, if you say what you really – know or what you think you're going to just panic people and i've said time and time again i have never seen anyone panic in all the years i've been in this business you know i don't see you know streets being filled with rioters or cars overturned or i haven't even heard of anyone pulling a knife or a gun when somebody grabbed the last roll of toilet paper had them in a recent in a department store but i know people are scared and they have a right to be scared people are concerned and they have a right to be concerned and so we promise you we'll always tell you the truth as best we know uh, and uh, what we can do about it. And I think at the same time, if I could leave you with just one last note, um, one of the things that has become abundantly clear to me, and as I sit here tonight, I think about the fact that one of my very, very best friends, my physician for over 30 years, a dear, dear man, a physician at Park Nicholas Medical Center, died this morning due to his pancreatic cancer and I couldn't be with him the last three weeks of his life because I didn't want to unsuspectingly or unknowingly transmit something to him that might have made his demise even faster. That's hard. Boy, that's hard. That's really hard. I haven't seen my grandkids since March 10th, even though we don't live far from each other. That's hard. So I just want you to all know we are all in this together. And as much as the science is important, as much as the science is real, and we'll give you that, we also all have to understand that the way we're going to get through this is having these very kind of meetings, having these very kinds of discussions, and doing it in a way that says it's not about each other, it's about us versus the virus, and we're committed to doing what we can so that when we get all done with this thing, we are the very best we could be. We've had the fewest number of losses of any kind, whether they be health-related or otherwise, and I just thank you very much for being here and, and willing to participate and share your feedback with me. Um, as my kids will tell you, I'm always open for learning. At least they want to believe that, and that's an important point. So thank you very much. I'll turn it back to you, um, Representative Craig, and I'll uh, be happy to address any questions if you like. Great. Thank you both for your work and that helpful insight. Um, now we're going to move on to the question and answer section of this evening. And the first question is for Representative Craig. Uh, today, the news said that the Small Business Administration has run out of money for the Paycheck Protection Program. What are you going to do to help the small businesses? Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, you know, I woke up this morning and we saw this coming a few days ago, uh, and I sent an immediate letter to leadership, uh, both in the House and the Senate, asking them to support funding for the Paycheck Prote Protection Program right now. Uh, we can't wait. Uh, we know there are critical needs uh, across the state. We've asked uh, that uh, on an emergency supplemental basis that we really prioritize three key things. One, we get PPP reloaded. We know we have lenders ready to continue to offer that assistance to small businesses. Um, we know that our uh, state and our cities, our governmental units uh, across the state need some assistance. 
Uh, that is a huge priority. Uh, and we need to we need to keep funding the emergency injury uh, disaster loan program too. So getting those uh, loans refunded is an incredible priority. There was another announcement today that kind of went under the radar, but uh, the tre the Fed announced that uh, they are going to be taking uh, the lo uh, increasing liquidity to our small lenders by taking those loans off their books. And so those loans are coming off the books. That means that our local lenders are going to have some capacity uh, to continue to lend here in our communities. But in a subsequent call later today, I've let my leadership know that uh, I'm ready to come back to Washington uh, if I have to, obviously within the uh, parameters of uh, what is going on in this country and with all the uh, caution and safety that one would uh, encourage. And of course, there are places around the country that are seeing uh, being seen as more of a hot spot than others. Uh, but we need to get this done and we need to get this done just as quickly as we possibly can. Great, that's good news. Um, the next question is for Dr. Osterholm. Um, when do you think businesses and restaurants will re reopen and people will be able to resume their life as normal? Well, first of all, let me just say uh, that um, we never will be back to normal. We'll have a new normal. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we're going to understand that the potential risk of viruses like this are always going to be there when we're in big crowds. Uh, you know, it was once said that after 9-11, should somebody ever have stood up on a plane in charge of the front door of that plane to get into the cockpit that the entire a passenger would immediately descend on that individual and would never let a plane be hijacked again. Um, you know, I wonder what it's going to be like being in a plane or being in a subway or being in a bus and having someone start coughing. So I think that we will have a new normal because people will always be mindful of this. So when will it go back? Uh, my best guesstimate is that uh, over the course of the next 16 to 18 months, we'll make every effort to try to do that. But we're going to have a series of starts and stops here where cases are going to start to increase quickly and everything will be done to put the brakes on that so that it doesn't take off and do what it did in New York or uh, in, in Italy, etc. And that could mean we could have a series of closings. Now, I think it's really important that we have clear and well-defined on-ramps and off-ramps for those closings. Uh, and what do we mean by it? And again, what we're trying to accomplish is really twofold. One is getting as many people to that period, whatever it is, 18 or 20 months from now, when we may have a vaccine, that we could then not have to deal with the virus anymore. But if we can't do that, we then want to have a plan where we try to, in a sense, bubble the uh, most people we can who are likely to have serious disease or uh, are likely to die. And we surely know that people who are older, people who are smokers, people who are overweight, people who have diabetes uh, are all a part of a category that are more likely to have severe disease and die. And so what we're going to try to do is bubble them. There are a lot of practical things we can do. And next week in our uh, release of our, our recommendation, something as simple, for example, here in Minnesota, we now have over 50 plus long-term care facilities that have been impacted. Long-term care facilities have long been short on good infection control or prevention of infections inside these facilities. And if I could right now, what I would do is hire uh, many of the thousands of nurses who have been furloughed because of the uh, lack of other kinds of care in the healthcare system, such as the elective surgeries and so forth, and working with the state and local health departments, help them be in these daycare or in these long-term care facilities, bubbling them so that they don't end up having outbreaks. Because I can tell you, I don't care how big your community is, whether it's 57 uh, citizens or it's 5 million citizens, when a nursing home has an outbreak, it quickly spreads to the community. Because, of course, everyone came to see dad or mom or grandpa and grandpa, et cetera, and then they got infected when they were there. And then when grandma gets sick, she ends up going to the hospital, and the transport then is involved, then the hospital gets involved. And so there's just one simple thing that will never go back to normal. But if we could do things like that, we can surely keep the frequency of disease at a, at a much lower level, which would give us the opportunity to go back out, be in public and, uh, and, and have more of a life that we've known before. 
But I have to be honest and just say for the foreseeable future, it won't be like it was. It just won't. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is for Representative Craig. This question is for, from um, Siri. And Siri asks, have you heard about any legislation that would specifically help people with disabilities and or chronic conditions during this crisis? Well, uh, I have worked really hard uh, to make sure that in our funding packages so far that uh, students especially uh, who have special needs are included and that their IEP plans can be met. Uh, legislation specific around to how do we fight COVID-19 within these populations. I'm not aware of uh, that legislation, but uh, if Siri wants to send me a particular proposal, we'd be happy to take a look at it at our office. But uh, making sure uh, that students with special needs uh, are still receiving the support that they need while distance learning is incredibly important to me. And I uh, just appreciate so much uh, all of the parents who are out there, uh, especially uh, those we have students with special needs who are now uh, having those students at home learning. But uh, if there's a particular proposal that she'd like us to look at, we'll certainly take a look. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is for Dr. Osterholm. Christopher asks, uh, can you speak to the fact or fiction of the idea that this will be a seasonal outbreak um, that just needs to be weathered periodically or is this going to be an ongoing issue without therapies and or a, vac a vaccine? Well, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, it's actually a question that was just recently uh, taken up by the National Academy of Sciences on the committee that I served. And uh, let me just say again, I'll make the comparison to influenza. This is not an influenza virus, but it's acting a lot like it. The last 10 pandemics of influenza over the past 200 and some years all had very interesting histories in that if you look at those 10, two started in the North American winter three started in the spring, two in our summer, and three in our fall. And when you actually looked at when the peak of activity was that occurred, it was almost universal, it was about six months after the first appearance. So that it didn't matter uh, what season it started in, six months after that, you would see the bulk of cases. Look at 2009 uh, with H1N1, which was a relatively minor influenza pandemic, but those cases first emerged in March uh, in Mexico, and then the big peak in North America occurred between mid-September and mid-October. It was still very warm. So uh, when a new virus like that first comes into the human population, oftentimes seasonality goes out the window. And it's not until the third or fourth year that it tends to settle in as a seasonal virus. So here we don't really know what's going to happen. Um, is this going to be a seasonal virus? Uh, and will it have waves like we see with uh, pandemic influenza? Uh, I would remind everybody again that in 1918, while the early peak was in the spring of 18, the big peak in the fall of 18, uh, in fact, uh, the, those cases continued right into 1920. And there were waves, smaller waves that occurred. Uh, and so we're not sure what's going to happen here. Could this be just a virus that just keeps burning and burning and burning and as much as we want to suppress it, hold it back, it just keeps burning? Uh, without big peaks, we don't know that either. So uh, this is where the element of humility comes in and dealing with this. But what I am feeling very certain about is this virus won't give up until it's made an attempt to infect every one of us. And uh, that's uh, that's what this one is going to do. And our job is just protect people. So we hope we can get to that vaccine status one day and find that uh, then we don't have to worry about it anymore. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is back to Representative Craig. Alan asks, uh, I'm very concerned with the with how all these bills are being funded. Are all of these bills that become law simply um, going to put us in a debt further? And if so, what is the strategy to pay this back? Um, he says, we cannot continue to spend money without a plan. So for the new bills you propose, what would be that strategy? Well, I appreciate the question. Uh, fiscal responsibility has been an important uh, tenet during my tenure as a member of Congress. If you will recall, the uh, bill that I actually had signed by President Trump is called the Payment Integrity Information Act. Um, in 2018 alone, the U.S. government, uh, pretty much out of six agencies, 
uh, improperly paid about $151 billion in one year. So there are two things that I would say to you. One is um, I do think that uh, we have to be thinking about the accountability and accounting for the dollars uh, that we are appropriating right now. I think it's an important question. Uh, I was uh, worried about just uh, how high our debt and deficits uh, we're getting before the pandemic, uh, and now, uh, obviously, it's it's going to be ever more important. On the other hand, um, we have never, I think, as a country, gone through anything quite like this from an economic perspective. And what I will tell you is, if you look back at the 2008 recession, uh, those countries that decide, decided that austerity was the way to go spent a whole lot longer uh, in a recession and those countries that decided uh, to move forward and invest to make sure that the economy could grow out of that were better off in the long run. So I would back up and say to you that, um, you know, as uh, Dr. Osterholm has said this evening, um, this virus has a mind of its own until we can get to a vaccine. Uh, and that means that we're going to have to be open and flexible to making sure that we keep uh, the economy, at least uh, the engine running, so that once we get through the public health crisis, we can stand the economy up again and have it grow. Um, I think that, uh, you know, many of us um, are making decisions right now that, uh, you know, certainly we didn't think we'd have to make in our first term in Congress. Uh, some obviously have never faced anything like this, but um, I think we're going to have to invest in America, invest in Americans at this moment in time. And don't forget, interest rates are pretty darn low right now if you were going to make a decision to invest. Uh, but there's no doubt that there will be some long-term economic shifts and consequences uh, to what we're doing right now. And at the end of the day, also remember, uh, there's an awful lot of small, small business uh, forgiveness loans out there, but for some of our larger businesses, those big businesses that we are helping stay afloat right now, um, this money is going to be paid back uh, to the U.S. Treasury. And so uh, it's been an important focus of, for me to have accountability to it and some guardrails, especially for big businesses, not to take advantage of these programs by taking the money and using it for um, compensation to executives or using it to buy back stock. So get the guardrails, make sure there's accountability. Lots of the money does have to be paid back to the treasury. Uh, but right now we're in unprecedented times. And uh, so we've got to do what we have to do to make sure our economy can uh, exist to stand back up down the road. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Osterholm, Leah asks, my great grandmother was killed in the second wave of the 1918 flu. What kinds of behavioral changes should we adopt as the norm until or unless a vaccine becomes available? Well, thank you. And again, I um, would hearken back to the 1918, just remind people of some pretty thoughtful figures. Even though the uh, 1918 flu was only present for the last three months of World War I, Eight, no, eight soldiers for every one that died over there are buried in France as a result of having died from flu. And uh, that's a pretty, pretty heavy thing to think about. Um, when you look at what happened in many country or many cities around the United States, for example, in Boston, just in a one month period, about 6% of the people between 18 and 30 died. So it's, it was remarkable. We're forcing that there yet with this, and we hope we don't get there. Um, and But yet, nonetheless, we have to be mindful that I just mentioned how quickly this disease went from uh, basically non-existent to now the number one cause of death in this country this week. Um, so that it really is a, a challenge. In terms of behaviors, I wish I could say we were further along, and we're not. Uh, distancing remains the best way to not transmit this virus. Uh, as I said, it's in the air you breathe. It's in the air you breathe out. If you're infected and you may not even know it, uh, you may transmit to others. We can't live our life in fear of breathing, but nonetheless, we need to understand that that's a possibility. So uh, we've had cases already just in the Minnesota in recent weeks. We have information people basically stayed home most of the time 
they made a few trips to, out to a store, uh, et cetera, obviously must have picked it up in that environment. And so I think that this is a challenge. Um, in terms of, of one other uh, behavior, I think that I would actually urge you could do right now, and uh, this may sound simplistic and frankly not, uh, I guess I'd like to think it's Minnesotan, but you know, people who really have a tough time right now are the healthcare workers. They're the ones caring for patients. Uh, they're working incredible hours. They're putting their own life on the line, uh, trying to be protected against this virus. And I guess I wouldn't tell you today to go hug all of your neighborhood healthcare workers that we don't want you to do, but just remember them. Reach out to their families, uh, you know, drop off cookies if you can, whatever. These healthcare workers today are literally every day putting their life on the line for us. And uh, they don't have a lot of protection in doing that. And so it's a, it's a remarkable thing. And that, to me, is one of the things we as Minnesotans can acknowledge and remember. Absolutely. That's something great to remind everyone of. Um, Representative Craig, Lucas, who is a college student, is wondering, what are you doing to help college students during this time, especially those who were filed as dependents in 2018? Yeah, Lucas, this was a really uh, big oversight in the Senate bill uh, in the CARES Act. Uh, as I said before, there was a, a link uh, in the bill that would have taken you to the tax code that basically serves as a definition under the child tax credit, which is dependent 16 and younger. Um, and to me, it was a complete oversight uh, in the bill. I have introduced legislation myself. I uh, pointed this out to leadership. I believe I was the first member of Congress to do it. Uh, introduced legislation uh, by uh, one day later. Uh, it's called the All Dependent uh, Children Count Act. And that would expand the definition of a dependent under the CARES Act, making obviously uh, eligible folks uh, get the rebate of an additional $500 uh, to 17 and 18 year olds. I, I've talked to a lot of folks uh, who uh, have uh, 19 to 24 year old students home from college. I certainly have uh, one in my basement right now. Uh, and then of course, a number of parents contacted me who are parents of disabled adult children. They all should have been counted as dependents under the CARES Act. I'm working with leadership right now, certainly moving forward. Uh, if we provide direct assistance again, which could be necessary uh, to Minnesotans, to Americans, uh, then we would uh, want to expand that definition. Uh, I've also asked, though, through my legislation uh, that that be retroactive and somehow these families be made whole. So, um, you know, it uh, was a terrible oversight, I think, in the Senate bill. My understanding is that they used the 2008 uh, bill, stimulus bill from the recession as sort of their starting point, and then that's how it happened. But uh, at the end of the day, we need to go back and fix it. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Dr. Osterholm, Ellen is wondering if you can please comment on the supply chain for raw materials for testing and critical care supplies. How long can Minnesota go at this alone and increase testing to the levels that are needed? And why is the Defense Production Act not being implemented to meet the need? Well, first of all, uh, that's a, obviously a very astute question because it is a critical issue that is often not being uh, addressed. And as you heard from Representative Craig, she did in fact comment on that at the opening of this uh, evening session how important this was. Uh, let me just take a step back and say from a testing standpoint, there are a number of other issues about testing that um, I think we need to look at very carefully. I have an op-ed piece coming up in the New York Times in the next day or two that addresses the fact that uh, what's happened is some of these tests are not all that reliable. Uh, right now, if I ran this test on you, uh, depending on uh, which test method we use, uh, we could find as many people were uh, positive for this who were infected and as were not infected. And there are some issues that we have to work out there yet. I, I think the FDA uh, didn't necessarily do itself any favors when after a failed effort to get early uh, testing out didn't materialize from the CDC, they more or less opened up the floodgates and said almost anybody who had a shingle that said testing on it could put a test out there for both the virus and for the antibody. And uh, so at this point, we're very concerned about what these tests mean. Uh, I wouldn't want to have somebody be in uh, quarantine for 14 days 
or to tell the nurse that she now had antibody and may very well be protected against the virus when she wasn't, and only to find out that in each instance the test was wrong. So that uh, we've got work to do on this, but testing can be a very important part of how we respond. And the issue around reagents is something that we've been raising for some time. I raised this on another New York Times up that piece I wrote almost eight weeks ago and said that, you know, wait, don't, don't go out and tell everybody to test, 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 because the tests don't exist. And the reason for that is the reagents, the chemicals that we use to run the tests, the, for example, the liquid that actually is very specifically takes the virus material out of the end of the swab and presents it to the test machine so that you can determine is there a genetic material from that virus in that. You need those chemicals. It's kind of like having a car without gasoline. And the problem was in when this outbreak first started in Wuhan, uh, there surely was an acceleration of the need for these kinds of tests. But the world's supply chain pretty much handled that. And then as the virus spread in other parts of Asia, ramped up even more testing. And unfortunately, some of the testing uh, uh, reagent development was coming from China, which got shut down. Well, then when the virus spread to the rest of the world and it was all on fire, rather than just needing a garden hose that had converted into a fire hose, we now needed a whole canal of reagents. And they just weren't there. And so we've been stumbling yet, and not just the United States, it's everywhere in the world. And places that once had adequate testing don't anymore. In fact, uh, there were people who were amazed for several weeks when New York was able to test, test, test. And as you may have heard yesterday, Governor Cuomo uh, made a, a very specific a point of the fact they were running out of tests. They didn't have any reagents to back them up. So this is a huge issue. Uh, and we have to address it. With time, we'll catch up. But it's going to take a while. As far as other critical supply chains, this is another area that our group has been very involved with. I wrote about this at some length in my book that uh, Representative Craig mentioned. And um, one of the challenges we have right now, again, is global supply chains. Um, we did work at the University of Minnesota, and I still have this uh, work on going, is we identified 156 drugs that are absolutely critical, acute drugs that we need every day or people die. What's on the crash cart, what's in the emergency room, what's on the ambulance, what's in the security. All 156 of these drugs are generic drugs, not one a brand name drug. Um, before the uh, Wuhan outbreak happened, already 62 of these drugs were in what we call short status supply issues. And on top of that, about 85% of these drugs were made out completely outside the United States. When we saw the slowdown in China, which is a major location for drug production, the obvious impact is real. Um, we're beginning to see major shortages of critical drugs because the supply chains had enough in them in December to last for about three months. And we're very concerned about this. We've been on top of it. Uh, we've seen uh, the problems. While this is not a drug, so we may have seen, for example, in New York, they're scrambling right now for dialysate, a chemical that's key to put in dialysis units for uh, dialyzing patients with kidney disease. And so this is a huge issue. And it's one I think we all have to take a step back when this is over with uh, and look at it and say, do we want to be that vulnerable again? What 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 can we do for backup? Um, and uh, I might add that uh, we work very closely with the U.S. military, and they don't have any more stockpile of drugs than the rest of the world does. Imagine if we outsourced our munitions to a unfriendly nation or one that might be a heavy competitor. We'd say that shouldn't happen. We do that with the critical life-saving drugs we need. So we're, we're very attuned to this. We're working on how can we better uh, know about this. Uh, one of the challenges we found is just getting the information to pharmacies and to the public, these shortages might be coming so we can try to find substitutes. Ironically, the one country in the world that has the best drug supply system is New Zealand. And we've been working very, very closely with the New Zealand government in our work. And in fact, their entire database for all their drug uh, surveillance and drug follow up in New Zealand is loaded on our University of Minnesota supercomputer. And so it's really been a, a, a challenging issue, but it's a critical one. And I can go through a number of other uh, critical products uh, that are part of the uh, supply chains of, of the world, particularly China, that we have to be mindful of. And I might add that we still have not seen China really get started again. Uh, as of early this morning, um, we have seen, uh, again, the major reduction in shipping come out of both Beijing and Shanghai. And so we've not seen the major prime in the startup of China as once we thought, which 
where it speaks to uh, Representative Craig's point about needing to keep our government lean and involved uh, so that we can recover when it's that time to do so. Good points, thank you. Um, for Representative Craig now, uh, Karen asks, how can we keep the US Postal Service from going bankrupt? Many folks get their life-saving medicine by mail as well as protecting voting by mail and low-cost ways to stay connected by letter and packages. So what do you think we can do to prevent that? Well, I, I think we're going to have to help the U.S. Postal Service uh, as a Congress. I think we're going to have to appropriate some funds. And, you know, remember, the Postal Service employs over 500,000 Americans uh, here in the United States. And so it's a major source for employment. Uh, for the country. And one of the reasons that the U.S. Postal Service is under pressure right now is because back in 2006, Congress decided that they were going to um, absolutely require the Postal Service to pre-fund retiree health benefits. So if you look back just in, I think it's 2018, that was about $5.6 billion on um, their statement just because of the pre-funding of the retiree health benefits. And so if you think about that, it's the only entity, any company in the world, any agency in the world that is required to do that. And, you know, it was a political move uh, to try to uh, make it look like the Postal Service was weaker than it is. And I just think Americans uh, are supportive of the U.S. Postal Service. We uh, are, it's an institution here in this country. It helps us uh, keep, you know, the ability to uh, send communication during these tough times. And you think about right now, um, you know, to me, I think about what the Postal Service once was, everybody having a post uh, post box, post office box, or uh, having uh, the ability to have a mailbox in front of your house. That's now broadband. That's now the Internet. And so we need to save, make sure that the U.S. Postal Service continues to operate. Uh, the House passed a bill. Uh, earlier this year or late last year that would take away this pre-funding requirement on the, on the Postal Service. And we really need to start thinking about um, in uh, one of our recovery packages in the future, let's make sure that rural broadband and high-speed internet is a huge priority because that's the new mailbox in America. Absolutely. Um, okay, this next question is for both of you. So let's start with Dr. Olsterholm and then have Representative Craig follow up. Um, Leah and Connie ask, do you support expanding vote by mail in these times? And what do you suspect the odds are of a national vote by mail in November? Well, first of all, uh, I do believe that we may have an interrupted uh, everyday life between now and well into next year. So uh, I can only assume that that could have a major impact on voting. Uh, sure. I think voting is one of the most sacred rights we have. So I would do anything that I think is within reason to support any alternative method for assuring that people could vote without putting their health in jeopardy. I hope I'd be wrong about that and that we wouldn't have a problem come next fall. But I don't think anybody can guarantee that. So we have to start looking at that now. Because again, as I said, I, I just believe voting is is one of the most sacred rights we have. And, and this virus will make every attempt right now to interrupt it. Right. And Representative Craig? Well, we're very fortunate in Minnesota because Senator Amy Klobuchar has been a real leader in the Senate on this issue. And my colleague, Zoe Lofgren, especially in the US House. Um, Minnesota is a great model uh, for the country. Uh, we have expanded in-person early voting to something like 42 days before election day. We have vote by mail uh, on a no excuse absentee uh, basis. We need to make sure um, that every state and jurisdiction across this country has that opportunity. So I certainly would be very supportive of expanding vote by mail across the country. And as part of um, our planning, just as uh, Dr. Mr. Holmes said, we need to make sure that every state, every jurisdiction has a publicly available contingency plan for November. We do not need to see what happened in, in Wisconsin happening across this country on Election Day here later this year. So uh, that is part of the senator's bill. I certainly support it. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're ready uh, no matter what 
happens in November. That is part of a larger conversation about America's preparedness, but we certainly need to be prepared uh, to uh, execute our democracy here in no November. Uh, and so we need to be absolutely prepared for that. Thank you. Um, this is the, the last question now, and this one is also for Representative Craig. It's from Carolyn who asks, what is happening with the oversight for the bailout money? I think that's what everyone's, uh, what's on everyone's mind right now. Well, in each bill, we're trying to start with guardrails. I mentioned earlier that part of the contingency for receiving the big, big companies, uh, receiving the dollars is that they have to commit. Uh, they won't use that money for stock buybacks. They won't use that money for executive compensation. So we want to build the guardrails into each plan to make sure that the you know, there are good rules in place to use those dollars. But as I said in my opening remarks, I do believe it is absolutely critical um, that as the member of Congress from the second district, um, that I take account of every taxpayer dollar that was spent throughout this. So uh, we will be continuing to build uh, strong accountability oversight into each of the proposals. Uh, and uh, we have to be able uh, to conduct that type of oversight because these are taxpayer dollars. This is your money and we've got to make sure that it's used uh, with the intended purpose uh, that Congress legislated. Sounds good. Well, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I've really enjoyed being the moderator. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Representative Craig for her closing remarks. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, it really has been an honor to be part of this this evening. Uh, Dr. Osterholm, you are amazing. Thank you for your candor, especially. Um, right now, more than anything in this country, we need to hear the truth. Uh, as members of Congress, as legislators, as public policy makers, we need to have the flexibility to do what is needed uh, based on uh, what happens with the virus, based on and always with the highest priority of uh, the public's health in mind, uh, but also balancing that um, with uh, what we need to open back up the economy over time. With that, I will just end by saying I believe uh, that uh, the plans that you uh, talked about this evening that you're going to be um, uh, proposing with your group in the near future are absolutely critical to opening back up our economy. And I look forward to hearing those plans uh, to hearing how we ramp up our testing capacity in this country, how we ramp up uh, the production of personal protective equipment, our supply chain, the logistics required to uh, make good on that for the American people. And then finally this evening, uh, I just want to end with a few comments uh, to our first responders and our healthcare workers out there. Uh, we know that you are on the front line and uh, this pandemic has certainly defined very clearly for all of us um, who is on the front line uh, in a pandemic, but who also is on the front line of society. So thank you so much to our teachers, to our janitorial workers out there, uh, the folks who pick up our trash every week. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the doctors and the nurses uh, who are uh, out there trying to save as many Americans as possible. And then Finally, I'm going to end with this. Um, you know, this is going to be difficult uh, for us as a country, as a state, and certainly in the second congressional district. Um, I know we will get through this together. We won't be the same when we're done. Uh, but uh, I would challenge each of us to continue to work together across this country to be there for each other and for our neighbors. Uh, you are on the front line right now if you are staying home to keep people safe. So keep doing that. Thank you so much for the opportunity to serve this district. It is truly uh, my honor. Thank you. Good night.